Okay, we're back, we're live, we're protecting the Pacific today with the um, Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, Gerard Fryer, senior geophysicist there. And we're gonna to learn today about uh, tsunamis and tectonic plates and subductions and why it all happens and what happens to us when there's a tsunami. Welcome to the show, Gerard. Uh, thank you, Jay. Great to have you here. Oh, happy yeah. to be here. Yeah. So uh, first, I want to I want to paint that old picture. You're standing on the beach. Uh, you're swimming. Who knows what? Or you're in Waikiki. You're you're right there in Waikiki, in the most valuable beach in the world. Okay, and you see something funny, and maybe you should think this is a tsunami. Uh, what do you see? Um, well. Uh that, that, that hypothetical situation would, would mean that we have failed at the warning center. Because you would know already. <laughs> because we would know already and we would have a warning out. Yeah. Um, uh, but the um, a tsunami coming in, a tsunami is a, a long-term phenomenon. People think it's just one big wave, but it's not. Um, very often the first wave of a tsunami uh, coming from a distant location, such as Japan, uh, it, it may be fairly modest. It may the water level may just rise a few feet and stay there for couple of minutes and, th and then drain away um, and uh, and you can see the beach and and you can see way. yeah the water will drain away and you can you can see the sea bottom and there might be fish flopping around and then it'll come back um, and so you may get several waves like that uh, in fact in 1946 uh, both in 1946 and in 1960 the two big tsunamis in our recent history um, the first wave to kill anybody was wave number three in both cases um, in 1946, the waves were 15 minutes from one wave to the next. In 1960, they were half an hour from one wave to the next. So, you know, if ever the ocean does anything strange, you should take heed. Uh, and, you know, the ocean's strange, is, yeah, that's a warning. Yeah, what, no, what do you do? I remember, uh, what was that big one in Southeast Asia not too long ago? Oh, in, in 2004, mm -hmm. in the, in, there was a big earthquake off the coast of Sumatra, yeah. and uh, it produced a tsunami across the Indian Ocean. Now, tsunamis in the Indo Indian Ocean are very rare. There was no warning system uh, in effect there, and, and so there was no warning issued and a quarter of a million people died in, yeah. in, in 17 different countries. Yeah. Wow. So um, they were at, at the water's edge when this happened, happened by surprise, and those waves, whatever the sequence was, just inundated and drowned them? How did they die? Um, w well, the ones in, the ones in Indonesia, uh, uh, the town of, of Banda Aceh, a big city of, of, of nearly a million people, um, there, they felt the earthquake. They, you know, very, very severe shaking, and uh, um, so so severe that, that you could, um, the, in video you see people sitting down on the ground because they can't stand. Yeah. And uh, and then they got up and went back to their business. But uh, they did not have a. It was uh, over. Yeah. And now these are people who were a mile from the water, but it's very, very flat there. And about 25, 30 minutes later, a big wave comes in, and. Um, the way people die in a tsunami, uh, to start off on, <laughs> on a more morbid note, mostly they drown. But the reason they drown, uh, I've, I've talked to, um, to some people doing autopsies, and they, they say it appears that mostly they drown because they have suffered some kind of trauma. They have been hit by something. Debris. By debris or something like that. They've been knocked out. Or, um, yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, it's not nasty. If you're in the water, you're not alone. You're in the water with, with washing machines, with pieces of coconut tree and building Something materials. will hit you. A and yes, there's a lot in there and something will hit you. Yeah. So um, what, now the tsunami comes and it races across this town, this city. Um, what's the next step? The water recedes just as quick? The water, the water drains away uh, maybe as quick or maybe a little slower, but... Uh, um, and it drags everything with it, and uh, and that and everything that's been dragged out, that's just armament for the next wave. So you know the first wave may not be carrying very much, but the second wave is carrying all the stuff that was swept out from the first wave. Yeah. So uh, and and so this can happen. Um, and and in Hawaii, what tends to happen is the tsunami on the open ocean has has swept past us. It's gone. It's it's gone but the waves are still bouncing backwards and forwards between the islands, and, they, and that can last for, for hours. Mm. 
What, what, what frequency would you expect in this circumstance? How, how often would those waves come? They're, they're typically once every, every five, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, once they start bouncing around, certain, certain bays, um, they will pick up uh, a higher resonance. Uh, one of our favorites is Keaho Bay on the Big Island that, mm -hmm. that seems to oscillate at, at about five minutes. Mm -hmm. There's water level going up and down about once every five minutes. So if you, if you see one wave, if you are experiencing or observe one wave coming in, you can assume that's not the only wave. There's that's going right. to be other waves for sure. That, that's right. And, and the other important thing, if we're, if we're down at the beach um, in, a, in a region of, of hazard, uh, the other important thing to remember is that these waves are separated by, by a considerable distance. You know, as I said, 15 minutes typically from one wave to the next. What that means is that, that when the front of the wave, the very edge of the wave is at your feet, the crest of the wave is out over the horizon. So, so there's, there's no way that you can just look at the ocean and figure out how high this water's gonna get. It's very, very deceptive. And I think that's a large part of the reason why people die. There's, there's this phenomenon going on, but the scale of it is so contrary to, to our, our, our common understanding. And hugeness. Yeah, yeah. So when I look, if I, I'm standing, uh, unfortunately, in Waikiki Beach, seeing a wave in, is, is, the, is the crest of the wave going to be like a big surfing wave, like one of those 25-foot surfing waves? Or is it going to be relatively small, but a big under, under bottom? Uh, most of the time, um, it's just a big surge. You know, the water level just rises, and, and the water just flows over the land like a river. Um, in, in some places, uh, and this happens in Hilo a lot, you get so much water in on the land, and then it, and then it floods off. And, uh, and then the next wave coming, there's, there's water flowing out as, a, as the next wave is coming in. And then sometimes the, the, the incoming wave then will, will rear up into a vertical wall. And so you'll have this vertical wall of white water coming at you. Um, That's after the, you can see the fish on the bottom. Yes. The open bottom. Yes. Well, it's pretty scary. Um, it's pretty scary, but we have a warning system that, that is pretty darn good, and it gets better all the time. So uh, before we get to exactly how that works, if there is a warning, uh, I don't know if there's a siren or uh, use, you know, a, a public media like radio and TV. Both. Both. Everything <laughs> everything, can, everything we can. Pump that word out, yeah. Um, what, what do I do? I mean, if standing there watching or to get my surfboard for a quick uh, surfing experience wouldn't be a good idea, what do I do? Well, um, typically what's going to happen is this earthquake is somewhere on... The, the nice thing about Hawaii is that Hawaii is isolated. Uh, we, we do have locally generated tsunamis, but, but they're... Um, a fairly modest extent. We can talk about them later if you like. But the, by far the biggest danger for us is tsunamis coming from an earthquake across the ocean. Because they're bigger or because they're further? Um, because that's where the big earthquakes are. That's mm -hmm. where the big tsunamis come from. Mm -hmm. And Hawaii is so, so isolated that um, the fastest a tsunami from a, from a big subduction earthquake, the fastest it can get to us is four and a half hours. And that would be for an earthquake in the Aleutians, mm -hmm. directly north of us. Mm -hmm. So, um, so your first indication that something's up might be the siren going off. You haven't felt anything. Then suddenly out of the blue, the siren goes off. What do you do? What, what we want you to do and what all the emergency managers in the state wants you to do, if the, if the siren goes off, you know, we have the same siren for hurricanes, for, uh, um, for bomb threats. You know, they want you to find out what's going on. So turn on the radio. Um, and if it's a tsunami warning, it'll say, and... Uh, and of course, if, you've, if, if you signed up for Nixle, uh, you'll get a page on your phone. Um, What's it called? Nixle, N-I-X-L-E dot com. This is a service provided by the city and county of Honolulu, free. Um, you get all the emergency messages. Ah, thank you for that, Nixle, N-I-X-L-E dot com. Right, yeah. and, and, and it will also tell you about, um, uh, uh, about traffic jams and, uh, and flash floods. And uh, yeah, it's sort of good, fun. Good, good, helpful. <laughs> Might help you. <laughs> um, so, so th that's what we want. We want you to find out what's going on. And, uh, and if it is a tsunami warning, and if, and if you are in the evacuation zone, then you should leave. And how do you know you're in the evacuation zone? Well, what I would prefer is that you know 
you know, that wherever you go, wherever you work or live, that you've looked in the phone book or you've looked online and you've found out whether or not you're in the evacuation zone. But uh, most people, you know, when the siren goes off, that's when they look. Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, we do have several hours, but uh, realize that everyone else is going through this same mental gymnastics. And, uh, and so very quickly the roads are going to get jammed. Yeah. I remember there was a tsunami warning, oh, I don't know, almost 10, 15 years ago. You, you probably know exactly when. But uh, so, you know, we were in an office building downtown. And in that case, we were in the eighth floor of the office building. Uh, no, actually, it was the, forget it, it was the 15th <laughs> floor. But um, so at that time, you could see everybody getting in his car and getting on Alakea Street and winding up in one huge traffic jam going nowhere for yep. hours. Yep. Uh, uh, that was probably 1986. Uh, 1986 was a very good lesson. Uh, that was an earthquake. We would not issue a warning for that, that earthquake now. Um, uh, that, that earthquake wasn't quite large enough to, um, well, it's, it generated a tsunami, but it didn't really send it in our direction. Uh, and we would know that now. Uh, but it was a very good lesson because uh, what happened was there was this earthquake and then there was a tsunami warning and, uh, and the state and the counties and many, many businesses just let people off. And so everyone just went home or, or tried to. At the same moment. All at the same moment. And so while you were up, you know, looking down on Alakea at that same instant, I, at the time when the tsunami was actually meant to hit us, uh, I was on the summit of Diamond Head looking down into Waikiki, and every street in every direction was solid with cars. They, it was yeah. absolute gridlock. Nobody could move. Yeah. And so if there was a tsunami, that, that in that case, um, the tsunami was like two inches tall or something. It was really small. It was actually, it was, a, it was about a foot, actually. A foot. Yeah. Not going to do much damage. That's right. Yeah. So uh, if the, in that case, if there was a real tsunami, I mean, a major tsunami from Asia or the Aleutians, what have you, uh, and you were stuck in traffic in your car, you would be in really bad shape, wouldn't you? Uh, that's right. I mean, we don't ever want that situation to arise again. Um, and How do you prevent it? Well, uh, here we're in a big, tall building, and there are big, tall buildings in Waikiki. Uh, we don't even attempt now to evacuate Waikiki. Just say, move, everybody move up. How high do you have to move? We want them to move up to the fourth floor or higher of a 10-story of a building. We, we were on the 15th floor, so I guess yep, we were safe. Yeah. And we, we knew that. I mean, somebody told us that. So, um, you know, we felt we made the right decision. Even if there had been a real tsunami, it would have been safe. But, you know, one, one question before we go to the break, and that is uh, you're relying on the structural integrity of this building. As we know, uh, not rebuilding has the kind of structural integrity you, you'd like to have. And it could be the tsunami is going to push the building right down. Isn't that possible? Uh, that is possible. That's why we say a 10-story building. Because a 10-story building, it's designed, it, a 10-story building is a hefty building. Um, and and um, if, it's, if it can handle the load, just, just the vertical load, it's going to be built strong enough that it will also ha handle the tsunami. Um, if it's lower than that, maybe not so much. But um, uh, the, only, the only buildings I know of for sure in, in Waikiki that, that are real questionable, um, the, uh, the original building of the Moana Hotel, which is wood framed, yeah. um, that, that is not, well, it's not even 10 stories, I don't think. Yeah, no. um, but uh, that, is, that is one building that might suffer damage, and then, and then the original building of the, uh, of the Royal Hawaiian. But um, most of the other hotels in Waikiki, they're actually, they would actually perform pretty well. And, and when you think about it, a hotel, you know, facing the water, you've got these big plate glass windows and stuff, that, uh, you know, because people get the view. So the tsunami's going to come in and crash right through that. But the bearing walls are on the side. And, and so... They the, would cut the wave, so to speak. Yeah, the, the wave is... is um, and and uh, there actually is a study uh, that the city is, is, is um, promoting, that it's trying to get funded, um, to, uh, to come up with... Um, criteria for a building manager to check out his building and decide whether it truly is uh, a safe site for yeah. refuge during yeah, a tsunami. Yeah. But uh, current codes would be would be okay. Following yes. the you don't have to change the code on this, the building code. Uh, 
there, there actually is a building code revision that will be coming up that, that will reflect tsunami loading for those buildings large enough to be uh, deemed refuges. You know what else is coming up, Gerard? Our break. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter and I am your host for Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and renewable energy future. I'm so excited to be here with you to talk about some of the most important energy issues of our day. And most importantly, who can we bring together? Energy engineers, artists, musicians, accountants, advocates, young people, who can we bring together to talk about how we can make this path together by walking and reach 100% renewable energy? Please join me Tuesdays at 1 p.m. for Power Up Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kawilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. We're back. We're live. We've had our break. Now we're back for more Revitalized. And we're going to talk about one other thing uh, over the, you know, the physical properties of a tsunami. And that is, uh, uh, Gerard Fryer, what happens to the ocean bottom? Is there a permanent effect? You know, we're worried about losing sand and losing beaches, you know, a tourist, uh, you know, destination. Uh, we're, we're worried about climate change in general and how it affects our our topography. Um, what does a tsunami do to that uh, that, that might be permanent? Um, well, it's going to cause a lot of erosion it, uh, and, and it's going to redistribute sediment. Um, so so one, of, one of the fears, uh, if we have a big tsunami, um, you know, will the channels in and out of Honolulu Harbor, for example, be clear? Will it, or, or in and out of Pearl Harbor, the, you, know, you might have sand that has been redeposited across. It's going to happen very quickly. Uh, if, yes. put, if the tsunami pushes the sand, say, from the open beach, or the, you know, the initial beach, it hits into, say, the Alawai Canal, the Alawai Canal is going to be topped well, off Well, the, 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 uh, there's another thing that happens, and that is, you know, a tsunami, uh, it's moving water all the way from the sea surface all the way down to the ocean bottom. So it can actually mobilize stuff from some significant depth, from, from say 100 feet or 150 feet down, and it can immobilize sand from down there and transport it. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that happens is erosion, and, and where it floods onto the land, there can be erosion. Uh, and actually, it's nice that it picks up the sand because then it carries it in and leaves it um, on the beach or on the plain that has been flooded. Save us the trouble. <laughs> well, then we can, well we can come along a couple of thousand years later and, and dig, a, dig a trench there and we see the sand and we say, aha, uh, this came from the ocean, you know, this place is subject to tsunamis. And in fact, uh, that is part, part of the logic behind our new extreme mm -hmm. evacuation mm -hmm. maps that we have in Honolulu because we now know that, that there have been these events mm -hmm. in the past that were a lot bigger than we thought. Mm -hmm. um, so. What about sea, sea life? You mentioned the fish. You could see fish when the wave recedes. How do those fish do? Do they get crushed and killed in the process? Well, anything left on the beach obviously dies. Yeah. Uh, coral gets uprooted. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a, there, there can be there can be major changes. The, the, out in the ocean, things usually recover pretty well. One of the big problems uh, that tsunamis do um, is that if it's really big, uh, and and you're a, a low island. Um, your water supply may be contaminated ah. because, because if you know, say you say damage the lens. If it's a coral atoll or something, uh, you know, and, and you you uh, you have a, a freshwater lens sitting on top, and now that's being completely covered by salt water. That's happening in the Maldives. That's happened in the Maldives uh, in in 2004. They basically lost their freshwater. And that's that's a long term loss. That's a long term loss. Uh, they are recovering now slowly, um, mm. but. The, but it was touch and go for a long time. Mm -hmm. They had to have, they basically had to bring in water from outside. Mm -hmm. If we were to build um, climate change type uh, uh, infrastructure around our island, such as Manhattan is doing, um, would, would that help or hinder this effort? In other words, would, would, would that be able to stand up against the tsunami? Probably not. Uh, and would, would it exacerbate uh, the result of the tsunami in some way? Well, um, 
that experiment has been tried. Uh, Japan uh, pours a huge amount of concrete. Um, and they, there are many areas in Japan where they have, where they have these tsunami walls. Um, in most cases, they, they've made the wall as big as they think the largest tsunami is going to be. And unfortunately, what happened in 2011 was they, they underestimated. They, they didn't, nobody thought, nobody thought, including me, uh, nobody thought at that time that Japan could ever have an earthquake larger than magnitude 8.4. And that, that earthquake was actually magnitude 9. And, and the, way it, the tsunami was way, way bigger than anything they expected. It's a logarithmic uh, scale, isn't it? Uh, 9 is way bigger than that, 8. That's right, yeah. yeah. A, a 9 is actually 32 times bigger than an 8. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Putting um, it in perspective. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and in fact... Uh, we now realize that what they, what they had done, they, they had basically prepared themselves for the 100-year event, for the worst event likely to hit them in 100 years. But then they got hit by the 1,000-year event. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the consequences for them of getting that wrong were so severe that, you know, that the rest of us have to take notice. And, and so we, at that point, we go back and look at how Hawaii had prepared itself, and we realized that we had done exactly the same thing. We basically had a 100-year perspective and we ought to have a thousand year perspective. And so that's why we now have these new extreme zones on the maps. So we now have two zones. We have the normal evacuation zone, and then if it's truly the big one, you, you evacuate the yellow, the yellow area as well. So all this is under the auspices of what, NOAA? Or the city and county, or a combination of agencies? Uh, well, the warning system is, is NOAA. It's actually part of the Weather Service. Uh, so that's federal. Um, the um, Th that's that's the, the science side of things, initi initiating the warnings. The sirens belong to the counties. Uh, the evacuation maps, uh, the determinations about those are made by the counties. Um, the state uh, acts as a, um, as a thoroughfare for federal money uh, um, and, uh, and distributes it to the counties, uh, through, primarily through the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program. Um, but... Uh, we all talk to each other a lot. We, we all sit down at the same table. We all know each other. Um, and, and this state actually works really well. Feds, state, counties, they all get together very well. Yeah, we're really exposed, too. Idaho doesn't have to worry about this. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can quote me on that. You heard it here <laughs> on Think Tech. Speaking of technology, I'd like to talk about you know, the most recent events in the tsunami warning system because you know, we kind of woke up when we went to the thousand year way of looking at it. Right. Um, and we realized, uh, as we should, that tsunamis are part of earthquakes. Earthquakes in this, in this globe, in this planet, are always going to happen. Right. And therefore, tsunamis are always going to happen. Um, and we just have to live with that. So the question is, uh, how good is our warning system? And the last time I looked, we had, we had only these sensors uh, out in the oceans. Uh, you said there were 7,000 of them. Oh, today. no. Uh, um, we have various sensors. Uh, there, there are like 700 seismometers. Mm -hmm. So those we use for measuring ground shaking. And, and that's where the initial warning comes from. And then we have about 50 um, tsunami sensors. These are, these are deep ocean pressure sensors. Mm. As the tsunami goes across, as they measure a slight increase are in pressure. Are these on buoys hanging off buoys? Or uh, it's actually a, it's a device sitting on the ocean bottom, and then there's a, a surface buoy, and the device on the bottom talks to the surface buoy acoustically. It actually issues a, a, a little a ping, a yeah. chirp, yeah. Uh, and the signal is encoded on that. Yeah. And, um, and, and so those measure tsunamis as the tsunamis come across. So if the water rises very quickly, that buoy is going to know. That, that device That's at the right. bottom is going to know. It, it will know. And, 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 uh, and they, can measure, uh, they can measure waves, uh, you know, a quarter of an inch. You, you, yeah, you can measure yeah. it. Um, and, and those are really nice. Uh, the trouble is that um, before you know about a tsunami from those things, the tsunami has to have got there from where it started. And typically that takes about you know, 40 minutes or an hour or something like that. Um, so all of our warnings are initially uh, based purely on what we, could, what we learn about the earthquake. Because, and that's because the shaking from an earthquake travels very fast through the earth. So, so we know about an earthquake and, and we can issue a warning within 10 minutes. Does every earthquake result in a tsunami? No. No. What's, what kind of earthquake results in a tsunami and what kind of uh, you know, seismic event results in the worst kind of tsunami? Okay, um, 
to make a tsunami, you basically have to change the shape of the ocean bottom. And, and, um, and I, the ideal way to do it is to, is to raise or lower the bottom. So uh, if uh, you consider the San Andreas, you know, wh which is what we call a transform fault, where, one's, where the Pacific is moving in one direction relative to North America, all the motion there is horizontal. So, so if that fault were under, underwater, and if there was a large earthquake, all the motion is horizontal. You're not late raising or lowering the water, so there's no, so there's no tsunami. So that movie, San Andreas, you know, that's, that tsunami. <laughs> no, thank you, sorry. Thank you for that, Gerard. That, that, <laughs> thank you. That wasn't right. <laughs> you heard that here on the <laughs> also. Um, what happens, uh, um, say, in the Pacific Northwest and, and uh, along the Aleutians and in the Mariana Islands, uh, there you have a, a tectonic plate that's diving down underneath the edge of the continent. Um, and so the whole edge of the continent or, or, the, isle, or, or the island arc is is caught against this thing that's coming down and it's deformed more and more and more and then it can't take it anymore and then eventually it breaks. Uh, like snap. It's like snap, a yes. Snap. Yeah. And when the snap actually lasts for about three or four minutes, that's the earthquake. Yeah. So, so what you're doing is you're raising the sea floor over an area that might be like 70 miles wide and, and maybe 200 or 300 miles long and you're doing it in only three minutes. So what you've done is you've changed the shape of the ocean bottom faster than the water can get out of the way. You basically lifted the ocean. Water is not compressible, right? It's that's that's right. Yeah, it, we assume that water is incompressible. Yeah. It actually is a, a, a little a scooch. Bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, but if it's uh, it's uncompressible, it has to go somewhere. That's right. Yeah, something's got to give, and um, uh, and so you raise the ocean surface, and and gravity doesn't like that, and this lump collapses, and and it oscillates, and and that's where the waves of the tsunami come from. Now the technology has changed, uh, or at least it's been enhanced by GPS. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, um, uh, with with seismometers, you're you're basically measuring waves, and and. Uh, uh, and we're interested in measure, um, we, we in particular want to be able to measure quickly the size of the largest earthquakes. The trouble is that when an earthquake gets really big, uh, the, uh, the waves that it generates are, are determined by the size of the area that was ruptured. So that may be very, very low frequency, like, like five minutes from one wave crest to the next. And you're measuring that with a seismometer. That takes time. And, uh, um, you know, you're measuring, you're measuring wave amplitudes on a wave that has a period that lasts for five minutes. Uh, so, so it, you know, you basically have to take five minutes to make the measurement. And, uh, you know, we want those five minutes. Um, GPS is different. GPS, uh, the geodetic grade GPS, which, which, measure, which can measure motions down at the millimeter level, um, there, um, it can see the, mo the motion immediately. It can, see, it can measure displacement immediately. So, um, um, you so have that a lot of data to work from. Now, you have much more data than you did simply with the sensors. As a result, you right. can do much more profound calculations on this. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, yeah and you, have it, you, you get the measurement a lot faster. The only gotcha is that you've got to have the sensors very close to where the earthquake yeah, is, is going to be. may not always be the case. But, well, that is the case in Japan. It's the case in the Pacific Northwest. It's the case in South America. Which are risk areas. Yes. Yeah. All of those areas now have enough. We're, have, we're getting a lot smarter, aren't we? Oh, we get, yes, yes. And the, and the other wonderful thing is that everybody shares data. All of the, it, it, yeah, everybody, we, we realize that we're all in it together. Yes. And, and uh, we, we, are, we are in it together. And we really appreciate you sharing, <laughs> sharing the data. <laughs> Gerard Fryer, Senior Geophysicist at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. We've only begun in the technology. You'll have to come back because I want to, may I say, drill down on that. Um, certainly, learn more sure. About it. Yeah. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you so much. Aloha.